we'll begin, if we may, Lord Dubs, at, at, at the beginning of your life. By the way, I'm Alf. I shall call you Alf, but I, I was waiting for the... Uh, <laughs> I was waiting for the permission. Okay. <laughs> That's a relief, Alf. Um, I, I, I've seen you speak before. I was at a recent Anne, Anne Frank Trust event where you, you, you spoke of your story. And as, as, as a middle-aged man today looking at politics in Britain and also in America and, and, and more broadly, I thought that the events you had to flee in 1932 almost belonged to not just a different era, but also a different species. It was, I couldn't, I've never, until the last two or three years, I never quite understood or believed, I realise, that Holocausts occur because of people who are just like our modern day. Yes, I, I suppose that's right. Look, I was six when I, when I, when I left Prague. I was in the summer of 19, 1939. And I suppose that what was happening was so horrific and was so overwhelming in terms of the, the civilized values that were being swept away that, that, that I, I suppose I was too young really to understand that fully. Yes. It wasn't until some years later that it all hit me when, when I began to puzzle uh, about my past and, and why it had happened. At the time, I knew things that were significant were happening, but I didn't really understand the, the reasons for it. For example, in my school book, School. I, I had a picture of President Benish in my school book. Yeah, yes. <coughs> we all had to tear that out when the Germans occupied Prague in March 1939 and stick in a picture of Hitler. Now I can remember that very vividly. There are other things I can't remember. Sure, but that was very, very vivid in my consciousness that, that, that here was my school book with the president had to be removed and this other person had to have a had to had to have his face in in my school book. But it's a curiosity when you're that age. It doesn't necessarily have a sinister subtext to a six-year-old boy. I didn't see it as sinister. No. I saw it. As something momentous. Yes. But, oh, okay. Uh, yes. I, this it, is a big deal. But the, I don't well, know why. Well, it's stuck in my memory. Clearly, uh, as, as to w w why this would be happening. Uh, but no, I, there was nothing sinister uh, about that, as far as I knew, at the age of six. No. But your father did. Your father fled to London the day the Nazis. The, the day or the day after the Germans occupied. Well, yes, he'd said to his cousins. Uh, I learned later. He'd said to his cousins, "Look, um, if the Nazis come, I'm getting out." And. Uh, uh, they'd said they'll take their chance. And it, we discovered later that in 1942, the Gestapo came for them. One of them had a cyanide pill and her husband went to Auschwitz or, or vice versa. And so my father, who was not political, must have known something. I don't know what it is he knew because unfortunately he died within the year. Yes. So I never had a chance to ask him. I should always ask one's parents lots of questions. So that was rare, was it, for, for, for an adult Jew, Jewish man in 39 to know quite so, to, to feel quite so urgently that he had to get out of there. Well, I think so. I can tell you a, a little story though earlier. My, after the Germans, uh, they, they were welcomed into Austria, my mother went from Prague uh, to, to see some friends in Vienna. And um, the story she told was that the, she said, tell me what's going on. They had a car. Mm. We didn't have a car. They had a car. <laughs> they drove her to the suburbs of Vienna, kept the car engine running and told her what was happening. And this was in the autumn of 1938, right. or very early in 39, before the Nazis had occupied Prague. And if in those days when surveillance methods weren't like what they are now, oh, uh, if people were so worried about being overheard that they went out of the city center in a car and kept the engine running so they wouldn't be overheard to, to tell my mother exactly what was going on. So people, I think, did know, or some knew. And yet a lot of the Jews of Central Europe seemed to await their fate. Yes. It was a fatalism on, on the part of a lot of Jews. My father, as I said, wasn't political. I don't know what he knew, what he knew, but he got out. And so did you, although in, in circumstances that are uh, almost impossible to believe, like most people of my generation, I, I first learnt of the kinder transport during that episode of That's Life in 1988. <laughs> I knew it as, a, as something that we'd, yeah, we'd yeah. studied in school, but to think again of it involving <laughs> real human beings and Nicholas Winton's astonishing work. I, I, mean, I, didn't, I knew I'd come on a kinder transport, of course, but I didn't know about Nicholas Winton until about the time that, that it all broke on television. Is, is that right? Uh, and, uh, no. and, and then I got to know him, and we became good friends. He was a great man, wonderful conversationalist, uh, you know, loved talking politics and stuff. You know, he was a great, great companion and friend. And the thing is, he kept his lucidity right to the end. Did he? It was at his 106th birthday party. <laughs> 
that I felt he was he was um, wobbling a bit. <laughs> yeah. Well, physically, when he was about 101, I said, "Nicky, how are you?" He said, "I'm fine from the neck upwards." But but he was absolutely clear. His mind was clear as a bell. By the time he got 106, I think he was just uh, yes. just fading away a bit, and he died not long afterwards. Yes. But what a great man he was. And the thing about him is, I mean, naturally, those of us that came on a kinder transport from Prague, we owe our lives to him. Yes. So, you know, when it's bound to be a bit attached to a person who saved one's life, that's, that's, a, that's <laughs> sort of human. But, but uh, he needn't have done it. You know, he stumbled on this situation in Prague in the autumn of '38. And then he was took, doing business there. He, he was, well, no, he, he was a stockbroker and he went, he was going on a skiing holiday and a friend of his said, come to Prague and see what's happening. Gosh. And he came over and some of the, the Germans had occupied the outer part of Prague after Munich, uh, Sudetenland, and some, uh, there were a lot of pro-Nazi people in the Sudetenland, but some of the Jews had fled to right. Prague and Nicky Winton saw what was happening. And then, of course, when the Germans occupied Prague in, in, in March 1939, even more so, and he could have walked away a lot of people have said, big problem, but not for me. And he said, I've got to do something about it, and just stayed there. <laughs> what a fantastic human being. It is, isn't you it? it, it it's, a, it's a mark. It's, it's an extraordinary yeah. response. Uh, and personal danger involved for him as well, yeah, they, well, up he, to a point. Uh, danger. He, was, um, he had to battle with the British authorities to get permissions. The Nazis were very suspicious of him. It was a difficult, difficult time for him. The, the, there was a spy who was watching him, and a Nazi spy was watching him and so on, pretending to be a Swedish person. And and I think it was absolutely phenomenal what he did. For, for people who aren't familiar with it, there were was, there was 669 Czech-born yeah. children. Um, mainly Jewish. Mainly part, Jewish. I'm part Jewish, yeah. Sure. Taken out of the country and, and brought to Britain, where they were placed with families who'd been established beforehand. There, there was a... Well, it was a bit more, can I say a bit more common than that? Yes. First of all, because my father was here, those of us that had any family members would have gone to their family members. Yes. Nicky Winton had to organise that <coughs> everybody had somebody to go to. So it was either a relative or a foster parent. And this was because of political resistance to, to the refugees coming here? or, or? Uh, uh, Well, I think I think he felt that the young children, you know, they couldn't just arrive at Liverpool Street and be, be set adrift. We had no. to have somewhere to live. You know, it was a, yes. <laughs> it was so, so he found uh, he found families, either relatives or or other people who volunteered to look after refugee children. And so we arrived with our dog tags on Liverpool City Station and we all had to sit in the room, we all checked off and be allocated to either a family member or to a, or to, or to, or to a foster family. And, and you were, I know you lost him shortly afterwards, but you were reunited with your father he at di- Liverpool He Station. died within, about, within the year, but yeah, I was reunited with him. And you know, you see what happened was my mother had tried to leave and was put, refused permission to leave. So she put me on a kinder transport and then she, uh, it was quite a dramatic story. Uh, she went, I think it was a Gestapo headquarters or somewhere like that, to get an exit permit. And they said, no, your permission refused. And they threw her down the stairs, just pushed her down the stairs. And she landed in a heap at the bottom. And before she could work out whether anything was broken or damaged, she realized they'd thrown her passport, her check passport, after her. And that gave her hope. Yes. Because without a passport, there's no chance of getting out. Sure. And uh, she then uh, managed at the last minute to fiddle an exit permit. Uh, and she arrived in London the day before the war started. That's uh, the autumn, uh, uh, sorry, the 31st of August. The Germany attacked Poland 1st of September. How, how did she explain to you what was going to happen? Do you remember? She told me in, 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 in first of all, my father disappeared. Of course, yeah. I was puzzled as a six-year-old. My father just suddenly off the scene. Well, he, well she said she, she'd gone to England, I think. And then she, when it came to the kinder transport departure, she waited till the summer holiday started, so it must have been the end of June, I think. And um, uh, and she said, I, I, she's going to put me on a train and I'm going to see my father. And that, that's how she explained it to me. And that, in a way, made it easier than leaving into nothingness. Yes. So I always say I was much luckier. I should think about two-thirds of the kinder transport children had no family member to go to, I'm guessing. Sure. Uh, and so I was luckier than most. And I'm always conscious of that, that I had a father to go to. A light at the end of the tunnel, as it were. As it was. And it was also hope on the journey. Yes, of course. It wasn't a journey into a limbo yes. and nothingness. It was a journey where my mother had said, you'll be all right because your father will be waiting for you when you get to London. How, how much of the journey do you remember? Uh, I remember the departure. I can still, I can still see your mum at the station? My mother at the station. I can still see in my mind's eye. I can see my mother and a friend of hers, two of them standing there, lots of parents. Uh, German soldiers with swastikas on the platform. 
and and it was late at night, interminable waiting and waiting, and the train went off, and I was in compartment. I didn't know any of them. Mm. Um, I was one of the youngest, I think, on that train at the age of six. And uh, I remember a long, long journey. We were sitting on hard wooden seats. Well, as a six-year-old, you yeah. don't, don't mind that. <laughs> uh, and uh, all day we crossed Germany, and German soldiers looked in. In some carriages, they'd apparently tipped the luggage out and so on, but they didn't in, in my compartment. And then we got to the Dutch border, and uh, it was dark by then. It was mm. long, slow journeys. And um, I, my, mem- my memory of Holland was, uh, uh, was I was looking out for windmills and wooden shoes, neither of which I saw because it was dark. <laughs> uh, but the older ones cheered. Right. Now, the older ones cheered because they were out of reach of the Nazis. I knew this was significant, but I hadn't, f- hadn't a clue as to why it was significant. I just knew it, it mattered in some, some way. So the, the fear wasn't part of your no, experience? I, I don't then. think so. No, I, I don't think Curiosity, so. Curiosity, confusion. Confusion, I think. Well, what happened was my mum had packed uh, some sandwiches for the journey. And when I got to, eventually, when I, my father saw my little knapsack, and he said, well, you haven't touched your food the whole journey. Apparently, I'd eaten nothing the whole 48 hours, uh, or eat virtually nothing. And, and so I must have been, oh, it's Anxious, fear. Yeah. What, whatever it was, it was something that, uh, the, 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 that stopped me feeling hungry. Or, so I may have been anxious, but I don't remember being anxious. The symptom of something happening was, was that I hadn't eaten anything. <laughs> yes, of course. And, and your father greeted you at the station. You're still not. How, how many years was it before you were aware of what a momentous event you'd been involved in? I, I mean solely the kinder transport, not, not the... Well, well I, I knew, um, I, I began to know when I was about 12 or 13, you know, I began to puzzle about history and what had happened. But it wasn't, and then my mother told me I'd come on a kinder transport. Uh, I mean, she was, of course, very shocked when my father died, and there she was. Uh, in another country, no language, no money, no job, nothing. Where were you living at the time? Well, we were living in Northern Ireland, of all things. How did you end up there? Well, (laughs) a friend of my father's, who'd left the Central Europe before all this, had got some money out and was given permission by the British government to set up a factory. And the British government said, you can go in an area of high unemployment, which is either Northern Ireland or Scotland. So this chap had found a factory in the middle of Northern Ireland and said, look, I've got this factory. If you ever escape... Uh, you know, you can get a job there. So we moved to Northern Ireland. So as my mum arrived, we moved to Northern Ireland, and then within a few months, my father had a heart attack and died. So we stayed there for a couple of years, and um, then um, then my mother felt no, no money, she can't go sure. on doing this, you know, can't live on nothing. Uh, and uh, so we went to Manchester, where she had some fellow refugee friends, and she put me into a school run by the Czech government. The Czech government had a school for Czech refugee children, about two and a half in the middle of Wales. Not all Jewish, but a lot of them were Jewish. Yes. And that was the school I went to uh, while my mother lived in a bed sitter in, in Wally Range in Good Manchester. Grief, really? Yeah. And you'd just go home in the holidays? Or, yeah, yeah, or, yeah. And, and then I, I sort of have this curious mixture in my mind of, of you being incredibly lucky and incredibly unlucky at the same oh, time. I think I was lucky. Yes. Look, most, a, lot of, most, a lot of people went through much worse experiences. Well, of course. Than I did. Some, some never saw their parents again from when the train pulled out to the station. Some only saw their, met their parents again who'd escaped, some parents escaped by Shanghai, for heaven's sake, and all sorts of things. And some, some were, uh, you know, had years of separation and so on. Uh, so, I, in, in a sense, I was I was lucky. And were absolutely. you conscious of that at that age? Did you feel fortunate? No, I don't think I feel anything about it. It's not not anything. Just I, a kid, I, aren't you? you you're just carrying on with it. You, know, you, you, you don't think about these things. <laughs> no, I guess you, 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 know. you, know, you, you, you just don't. You, you look. I had to learn English. Uh, as I said, I spoke Czech and German. When I, when, when I got to England, I, I, I knew about three words of English, so I had to learn English. Uh, and my challenge. You learn English pretty fast in a school playground. Of course. And yeah. and also, you, 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 you're unfazed as a child. You take things in your stride in a way that perhaps you couldn't do as an adult. You I think so. struggle more. I, I was too young to be to be upset by all this. Yes. Uh, I, I think you just take things as, as they happen and, and get on with it. I was very... Sh- I was absolutely shocked my father died. Suddenly a heart attack and died within the day. And that really was very, very... That was traumatic. I yes. remember that. Yes. Uh, but... Um, 
beyond that, one isn't too phased by these things. No, at least well, I don't remember what I was phased. Now, what, what, what you know? What is something of seven? You know, how do I know what I felt? You don't know what normal is either. I, do I you? didn't know what I didn't know what feelings were at the age of seven. I didn't. <laughs> nobody ever mentioned the word feelings no, to me in Czech or German or English. So you know, it, you know, I, I I don't know. What sort of schoolboy were you? Uh, nervous. Were you? I was nervous. Yes, I I was I was. Uh, well, I I felt. I suppose I was insecure somehow, uh, and uh, uh, well, I, I worked quite hard, and I was I was I was not too stupid, I think, at school. And I, what did what was interesting was once I learned English, I lo- I loved reading, did you? and I would sit there reading and and and, and uh, uh, you know quite quietly when the teacher said you're all going to read for the next half hour, and 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 I I would just read and and I loved that, and I got totally enthralled in books and things. So that that helped me to learn English, of course. It's of course. quite quite good. And did you make friends easily? Yeah, fairly easily. Yes, I think so. Yes, 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 I did. And the Czech government were running the school, but well, well, I've been to several. I've been to so many schools, I've lost count of them. Have but, you? but 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 I went to school in Northern Ireland, actually, a primary right. school. But then then um, then uh, when we came to Manchester in the middle yes. of the war, this was um, then I was sent to the Czech school, where I had to learn new lot of friends again. Yes, and you were being prepared not to return to Czechoslovakia uh, th- as it was. That wasn't certain. Right. Uh, th- the decision was going to be left open. Uh, indeed, people didn't think about that. People were more concerned about the war being over and, you know, all that. How so, did the war impact on you in Wales? I mean, I, I appreciate that you had to leave your mum in Manchester. There had been bombs there. but in Well, um, <laughs> um, how did it impact on me? Well, uh, quite all the teachers were in the Ch- Czech army uniform. Right. yes. Uh, there was an RAF plane that crashed, and all the crew were killed uh, about half a mile from the school. Really, it was a it was a uh, uh, either a British bomber or a British um, coast guard plane. Anyway, anyway it, it was very traumatic. It crashed on the hillside. We could see the the flames and so on. Just uh, but uh, but again, you, this you, you've got no point well, of reference. You've got no way of saying this is extraordinary. This is never. This didn't happen in the last decade or the next decade no, or the decade no, before well, that. Well, this is the only reality you uh, have. Yeah, on the other hand, then I began thinking hard about uh, politics and what was going on. What age that. is this then? <laughs> I was about eleven or twelve, I think. And why? Why do you think that? Well, came I came alive. You wanted to understand why these things were happening. Well, I, that happened when I was thirteen or fourteen. I right. think I really wanted to understand why what was happening, why what had happened to me had happened. Yes, you know, and why why it was that evil men in politics could do so much harm, and maybe politics could also work for the better. Right. But I was trying to understand it, so I was more interested in politics than than I think most people of my age would have been. And when you had the, the you know the personification of evil that you're trying to unravel. When did you start discovering political figures that you could be inspired by or who could be positive role models? Well, around this time? As well, you read I'll tell you when. No, well, the moment, uh, my mum had a boss. My mum got it. My mum started scrubbing floors in a, in a, in a British restaurant. Uh, British restaurants were a chain of restaurants that were set up by the British government to be near the... Most factories were war factories. And yes. There was no catering. So they set up these restaurants... Uh, so the little cafeterias and the workers in the war factories would go and have their midday meal there. Right, yes. And my mum started scrubbing floors in one of these in Cheetham Hill in Manchester and then gradually got a, got, got, got a, got a bit of promotion. That's, <laughs> that's, uh, that's, that's what happened. And that, that gets her on, the sort of, on a better economic footing. Where, where, did, you start, where did you start finding polit- political figures that yeah. you could look at? Well, I'll tell you what it was. It was I, I think my mum had a boss who yeah. was a very keen Labour Party person and somehow a little bit of that sort of Filtered Wafted, through. Filtered through to me. And then I remember the 1945 election. I'll tell you a story about that. Now, 1945, 1912, I think I was yes. then. Yeah. And uh, my mum had taken me for a week's holiday to near Blackpool, St. Anne's. Led them, yes. And in, in, uh, in the 45 election, because a lot of the British troops were in the Far East, uh, their ballot papers had to be sent back. So there was a long gap between the, uh, the voting in England and, uh, and the counting of the votes while the soldiers' votes w- were shipped back. So, uh, so, uh, and of course, no television those days. So yeah. uh, in the centre of the square, the BBC were going to announce uh, the, 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 the election, was, uh, election results starting at, as, as they began counting at nine in the morning. And the people in the boarding house, uh, I said, I go along and listen to the results. 
because I'd watched all the posters in the election campaign. I knew all the candidates in Manchester, all that sort of stuff. You know, things like Captain So and So will address voters uh, <laughs> on his return from the Western Front. It was all Gosh, that sort yes. of stuff. Anyway, so I got there, and the, the lunchtime score, uh, lunchtime was, was something like Labour 120, Conservative 30. So I went back to the boarding house and said, What is it? And I, I said very proudly, I was Labour then, uh, <laughs> Labour 120, Conservative 30. And I remember voicing, Oh my God! It's the end of England. <laughs> <laughs> That's sort of stick, stuck in my memory. Oh my God! It's the end of England. Yes, brilliant. <laughs> so, so anyway, so then of course I had all the excitement of 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 the of, of the Attlee government and all all the things that happened. Why, Alf? Why did you? Why why were you Labour? Why? And I appreciate your mum's boss had had an influence on you, but what did they represent to you? Because for for a lot of people who are who are who weren't around in '45? The idea that Churchill could win a war and then lose an election is still quite hard to understand. Yeah, I suppose it was. Really. I don't. I don't know. I. I, I would just. It just seemed right what they were saying and so on, and uh, different Britain and and a uh, bit of public ownership and things yes, like so, that. Yes. So the idea of, yeah. of drawing away from. Uh, yeah. a small minority of wealthy people. And but just... I mean, I, I can't analyse in very much detail. You know, I was a bit young for... No, I know you were, but still, <laughs> but, but, not many 12-year-olds uh, identify as Labour uh, through and through. Well, well, I, well, I did, well, I did that. I was, you know, I, as I said, when they said to me, oh, my God, it's the end of England, I thought I was right. And, <laughs> and, and then i tell you another thing that happened, though. It's I, I, I was, I was then, uh, well, I'm ju- jumping ahead a bit, but I was in hospital the day the National Health Service started. Right. I, I had an ear infection. I was in Stockport or infirmary. And uh, I was I'm quite ill, but I was the only child in adult ward. I was 14 or something. Yeah. Anyway, and in those days, when the consultant did his week daily round, if you were well enough, you had to stand to attention. If you were in bed, you had to lie to attention. Really? It was very, for- very, very formalized, you know, you, you, and you didn't really speak unless you spoke to him. Anyway, he looked at me and walked, and I said, just a minute, I've got a question to ask you. <laughs> uh, I said, when are we having a party? <laughs> So he said, he said, what for? I said, well, the hospital's ours today. Oh, wow. And I, I uh, anyway, he walked away a bit sniffily with yes. his entourage of Maiton and junior doctors. And the other people said, what's well, going on there? And I said, well, the hospital's ours. It's a great day. You were across it. Anyway, so I remember this was one of my first political stands. <laughs> so I, well, you know, it was. And, and after all, even today, that was the most significant things in British history. Absolutely. Setting up the National Health Service. Fantastic, fantastic. And, and yet there was resistance from, from the medical profession, wasn't there, yeah. within within the health. So the doctor who was sniffy with you would not have been exceptional by any stretch yeah, of the imagination. Yeah, I think that's right. And I, I remember I followed you know, Nye Bevan, who was uh, the, the Minister of Labour Government yeah. who pioneered the health service. I listened to some of the stuff on, on the radio and what he was saying or in, in the newsreels and the cinemas and so on. I've jumped ahead a bit of you. Yeah, but, don't worry, don't but, worry. It's but, the but way this, it works. But we this can, was, this was jump it's just one, one, one of those moments that, that I can still see myself lying there and the consultant walking away and, and, and I felt, well, I'd done the right thing. <laughs> But that, that's what I'm intrigued by. That's what I'm trying to pin you down on, 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 on this kind of uh, dawning, a, a political consciousness that you developed. And I, I don't want to use highfalutin descriptions of it, but it, but you were young. You could have been forgiven for focusing entirely upon your own survival and your mother, you, you know, looking after number one, given that you'd had to. But it, it, essentially, and what I was hoping to coax you into saying when I asked you why you became a Labour man, is what I'm hearing is a notion of fellow feeling, a notion of... Of community, I suppose so. Look, you asked me to analyse motives, which I probably wasn't aware of at the time. Yes, uh, I, I am. And I, I, I don't, well, I could sound I could sound all uh, far sighted and wise, not be, well beyond my years. You know, I could put it well, well, But you must have had a notion of what appealed to you. Well, what what appealed to me? I'm trying to think back without filtering it through I, the I, passage I, of time. Of course. Uh, I I think there were things that the Labour Party was saying about uh, taking over the key industries. Yes. Uh, and and Britain had shared things during the war and we wanted to go on having that sort of spirit spirit in the community and that we could change the country for the better. I think there were things like that. Yeah, this was what things you were like picking that. up on. I think I was picking it up. And, you know, maybe if I'd met somebody who was a, a passionate conservative, they, they could have argued with me, I'd have lost the argument. I wasn't good enough at arguing. But... Um, uh, I think I think that's I think that's what that's what I felt at the time, and I was well. Well, I must have been because I was so proud when I when I read the lunchtime election results. You know, in that boarding yes. house near Blackpool. Yes. You know, and the way. Things. And you understood what the the founding of the NHS meant, even in 
relatively simple terms, yeah. you understood this was an enormous, an enormous, and almost, for, for someone my age, it's almost impossible to imagine yeah. a project of that scale and yeah. scope being I, I, realised. Absolutely. And of course, I didn't realise the scale and scope. What I knew no. was the hospital was ours and we had a health service. See, my, I'd seen on the news reels, because no, te- no television, on news reels, I'd seen the miners a year and a half earlier celebrating the, the mines. National coal board being set up in the mines, and I had, and they had a party, and it was that sense of they were miners having a party at the pitheads when the mines became British nationalised that, that that I wanted to translate that in, into into the health service. But there was a sort of a wave of keenness and enthusiasm in the country about these things. Yes. I remember my mum, my mum had then moved to Blackburn, and we, we'd been in London to see her, some friends. And we were travelling back on New Year's Eve and we had to change trains in Preston to go to Blackburn. And it was an, I forget which year it was, it was an, the railways were being nationalised the following morning. Right. The, there was snow, it was bitterly <laughs> cold, the waiting room didn't have any heating. It was uh, completely awful. And we're sitting in this waiting room, waiting plain to, pain, painfully sl- for this train to come to come and take us from Preston to Blackburn. Uh, and, um, and we're sitting there saying, isn't it awful and so on. And then... Somebody said, oh, the railways are being nationalised t- tomorrow. And somebody said, right, and from tomorrow we can blame the government for all this. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, Very prescient. <laughs> I'm so, absolutely. So I thought, you know, there it was. So these were all, this was all the mood of the time. Yes, clearly. And did you ever have your party? At the, in the in hospital? The hospital? No, no, no. Right. Well, I was a bit too ill for that. You're clearly, <laughs> but clearly. It, it was, um, uh, and, then, and then we come to the question of, of when you began to feel or, or believe that this could actually be that politics could be your work, politics could be your job, or at least you could make a contribution to politics. Well, I tell you what it was. I, I was by then I was passionately interested in, in politics and labour politics and all that, and I followed what was going on. And um, I, but I always felt with my background I couldn't really. This was because you were foreign or. Just I or? didn't have the background. Yeah, because I was foreign and all this sort of stuff. Okay. Yes, I just didn't feel I'd no political background in my family. There was nobody to sort of argue with or talk about. Many of the eminent Labour people have always had in their childhood. They had good discussions yes, did. around the kitchen table and so on. They you never had that. So no, no, You didn't sharpen your blades on anyone. No, I didn't have any sharpen. So it was, a, no. it was a sort of autodidactic then. You were teaching uh, yourself. You were... Well, that's right. And, 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 um, uh, and, and so, so, you know, I, I, I got interested. And then a friend of mine who was an MP, I got to know an MP through the local Labour Party, and he right. said, um, you should have a go. And I said, I can't. And he said, you should have a go. Anyway, I began meeting some MPs. I know it sounds awful because I have a lot of respect for MPs. <laughs> well, there's a big but coming, isn't but The big but is, uh, <laughs> I said, well, if these people can become MPs, <laughs> anybody can. And, yes, and, well, that's the best way to arrive at those. It's know, actually quite modest. Seems, anyway, I, then, I, then, uh, I actually then stood, stood for Parliament. Up to then, I'd always thought my height of my ambition would be to get on a local council. Right. But anyway, I stood for Parliament in the cities of London and Westminster. And uh, this was in the 1970 election. Right. Now, it was a pretty safe Tory seat. Yes. And the Tory uh, candidate was Christopher Tugendhat, and there was I, the Labour candidate, and there was this constituency in the heart of London, yes. heart of the empire, as it was then. And uh, I thought to myself, well, here's a refugee from Vienna competing with a refugee from Prague. And the media never picked it up. Did they not? They did not pick it up, no. How but, would they have reported that in 1970? Well, they said two refugees battling for the heart. But I don't know but, how. But they, would, it, would, have been, would it have had a positive glow? Would it, would, it, would it have been a, a source of pride? Well, it could at least have been a diary item, just saying. <laughs> that. I'm not questioning the news value of the story. I'm wondering about the mood of the time, because we'll move on briefly. Yeah, I, I don't, the answer is I don't know how they, how they would have dealt with it. Look, I never made anything of my background right. at all. I neither denied it. Nor talked. Uh, uh, I didn't hide it. Nor, nor, nor did yeah. I uh, trumpet it. Or, did nothing. Or, or, yes. Uh, because I just thought it's one of those things, and I, you know, that's not anything. Did important. you encounter prejudice? Did you encounter? My mother did. She did. Her accent and so on. Yes, she did. Yes, yes. And did. would it be anti-Semitic or would it just be xenophobic? I don't know. Uh, she applied for a job. Um, uh, her boss left. She she acted up. Um, uh, they ad- advertised the job. She applied. She was turned down. wasn't filled. She acted up for another six months. Applied for the job again, uh, having acted up. Uh, she was turned down again, and she heard somebody say, "We're not giving a job to that bloody foreigner." Right. Uh, now she had a very strong, um, you know, Central European accent and yes. all that sort of stuff. But she was absolutely mortified. You know. Well, I'm sure. And and when she told you that, 
by by now you you knew what yeah, feelings yeah, oh, were. Yeah, yeah, by yeah, now you had yeah, feelings. Yeah, you, you, yeah, of course I did. Yes. How did you feel? Well, I felt incredibly upset for her because I realised, you know, there she was battling, you know, mm. on her own, trying to look after me. Yes. And I felt very defensive about her, and I suppose that experience made me both supportive of the ambitions, not the ambitions, support, made me supportive of women in getting on in, in, in the world, getting equal pay, mm. and also made me very critical of discrimination and prejudice. I think that was quite a, quite a, um, a notable event that happened. Yes, I can imagine. To, to her detriment, of course, very much to her detriment. But, um, Formative, isn't it? it, I think it? I think it had an influence on me, yes. It yes. Um, you... you I have to put this delicately. You, you, you lost, um, obviously, in 1970. Oh, yeah, but then I became a local councillor. Yes. Uh, 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 in Paddington. And that was interesting. I loved being a local councillor. Oh, of course, we were outnumbered by the Conservatives. But Westminster had a very sort of um, one nation conservative regime. Mm. So it was actually, they, they, they went too hard, hard with us. And I made some good friends. You know, it was a very collegiate thing in the Labour group, and we had some good friends. There was one issue which divided us, and that was when the Ugandan Asians came, and the government asked all local authorities to take Ugandan Asians. And we had a very, very angry debate in the Labour group, and really? the Tories had one as well. And in the end, Westminster became the first council to give so many council houses to, um, to Ugandan Asians. The argument against us in the Labour group was, was uh, so my friends and colleagues said, you know, you are denying housing opportunities for even longer to working class people who, who ought to deserve better housing. And that was a very painful decision to have to make at the time. Of course. Well, by this point, then, you would have, put, you would have listed refugees on your areas of particular yeah, uh, political interest? Refugees and, 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 yeah, and anti-discrimination and so on, yes. I was actually chair of the, the local community relations council in Padding, the Westminster Community Relations Council, so we're trying to you know, do positive let's, things. Let, let's step back a bit then and, and sort of look at, at, at an overview because I think a lot of people are very depressed at the moment about the toxicity that we've displayed as a country or that our media whips up against refugees. Um, in a sense, the notion that it was ever thus could be quite reassuring because it says to me that I don't live in particularly horrible times. It, it, it was the same in the 70s. It will be the same 50 years from hence. But mm. if, if I, like you, had spent much of my life battling on these fields, mm. I think I'd be very um, dismayed to wonder whether progress meaningful progress within our population has been made since the Ugandan Asians arrived, moving forward to your attempts to bring more Syrian children here? There were a number of things that happened, both with the Uganda Asians and later, which didn't provoke the outcry which refugees provoke today. Oh, no. Um, I didn't want to hear that. Well, <laughs> you know, because we also, I, I then, at one point in my life, I, I was chief executive of the Refugee Council. Yes, I know. And we were asked to facilitate several thousand Bosnians from the Serb, the horrible Serb concentration camps, I call them, mm. and help them, help them, uh, you know, come to Britain. And I don't think there was that outcry. Uh, no, there wasn't. I had to in my spare room as a student. Well, <laughs> well, uh, we, we, we organised, we had to work our socks off. I mean, there were some stupid things and nasty things that happened, Absolutely. unhelpful things that happened from some local authorities. But um, but on the whole, we, we together with the Red Cross organised reception facilities and so on. And there wasn't the outcry either then, or, or there was some outcry then. I, th I think it's the early nineties now, isn't it? It's, it's um, the, the, the Bosnians were the early nineties. The the the, the Bangladesh, uh, the, the, um, the Uganda Asians. Were, oh, I did. That was a previous decade. Were, were, in, were, were in the were in the seventies. Why do you think that is then? Because we're, we're going to talk about the Dubs Amendment and your more recent political attempts, but just briefly as an overview, why do you think the reaction to the Syrian refugee crisis was morally worse than the reaction to the Bosnian one? I think, uh, I think people at the moment also mix up immigration with refugees. Yes. And the argument for refugees, I'm not saying there's anything unworthy about being a migrant, uh, but the argument for refugees is that people are fleeing for safety from the threat of war, war, persecution, torture, imprisonment, and so on. These are people who are escaping a terrible fate in the countries from which they fled. And I think up to a point, 
British public opinion understood that. And then we've had more people come into the country over the years who are not refugees. And there's been a sort of sense that um, this, is, this has got a bit out of hand among yes. some people. Now, I get We've that. A deliberately provoked sense. Yeah, yeah but that sense is more marked in the areas where there aren't any of black course. faces than in the areas where there are Always. black faces. So, uh, it's you the know. Fear that, of the, the, the horde over the right. hill, isn't it? That's, that's gonna... right. But, but I think that fear, through the politics of it, has come higher up. And, and so people are now more resistant. But having said that, and we we'll come on to child refugees, I still yes. believe that essentially British public opinion supports the idea of child refugees. Yes. And the argument is that they know what these people, young people, have suffered and the dangers they're in. And it's similar to the dangers of the older Uganda nations who are being persecuted or the, or the Bosnians who came and so on. So I, I think British, British public opinion is, is being buffeted in different directions. It is. But, but you know, if we... If I, I don't jump ahead of you too much, but I mean, if you look at jump some, wherever you some want. of the things that were said during the referendum campaign, yeah. I mean, they were shocking. They were lies and they were absolutely shocking. And what they did was they poisoned the atmosphere in our country. And I'd felt before that that things were getting better, that I hoped the argument for child refugees would spread over into more sympathy for all refugees. Yes. And there wouldn't be this hostility to, to migration. And the one quote I can give you, during the referendum campaign, I knocked on massive doors. I worked very hard, I, although I say so myself. <laughs> uh, well, you know, and, and, uh, and uh, other people talk about what they did. I, I actually did it. Anyway, yeah. by the way. <laughs> and, and this woman said uh, she's, she's going to vote leave because of immigration. Mm. And I said, listen, I had a small procedure in hospital, and everybody, just obviously in there enough the day, and everybody, doctors, nurses, they're, they're all immigrants. Yes. And she said to me, ah, it's not the ones that are here that bother me. That's fine. It's some further ones that are going to come. And the way the atmosphere has been poisoned in this country is by certain politicians who, in the referendum campaign and elsewhere, have said there's a big threat of these extra people coming. I mean, our foreign, Boris Johnson said 70 million Turks were poised to enter Britain mm. com if, we, if we stayed in the year. Complete fabrication, a complete fabrication. From a man with a Turkish grandfather. Yeah, but it's a complete, yeah, exactly, but a complete fabrication. But it was that, and the UKIP posters were the people, yes. and that inculcated fear in people. And it's those sort of things that have poisoned the atmosphere. Now, there was a bit of that before the referendum of campaign, of course, but it's the general politics of saying we've got to keep the numbers down and so on. Uh, that have all had an adverse effect on the way the public see these things. And, and yet, and we'll move back to that in a minute, but to leap back to, to the, the <coughs> expulsion of the Ugandan Asians, your colleagues who argued that it would make the housing waiting list longer for British people and, and the Conservative compadres who did the same, they were right. I mean, that, that, that's part of the problem as well. Well, it's, a, it's, a, it's a definitely, you can't challenge that. Yes. If we've only got so, and so many council houses, in those days we were still building council houses, <laughs> if, we've only, if we've got so, and so many council houses, you know, uh, and we give the top 20 or 30 on the uh, places, to, not to people on the waiting list, but people who just arrived, exactly. of course, and I think it was a very, very painful decision. I voted in favour of doing it, but I think it was one of the most painful decisions in which I've been involved, because right. I could see the force of the argument the other way, of course. and I could see the unfairness of whatever happened. It was unfairness yes. on either side of the argument. And that distinction between refugee and, and migrant then becomes absolutely crucial, yes. because you could only really persuade yourself or someone else that their need is greater yeah. if, if it's against the context of what they're fleeing. Yeah. So what That's happened in the referendum were the attempts to minimise what they were fleeing from and to That's almost right. demonise the people who were uh, running away. Uh, absolutely. And, and that, that was the awful thing about the referendum and that's the awful thing about public opinion. Now, as I said, there's nothing unworthy about being an economic migrant. And I think as a country, we've benefited from the people coming from the EU to this country. I mean, yes. A lot of jobs wouldn't be, wouldn't be filled and, and, and we, we have benefited enormously. But, but in terms of the warmth of the welcome that should be offered, it, right. it's different. Yeah, and therefore I put child refugees in a, in a slightly different group. Yes, of course. Because once people are told in this country what those young people have suffered and the terrible plight they're in, then public opinion becomes more sympathetic because they are children. You know, they're under 18, many of them under 16. They're children, they're young people, and no young people should, should, should suffer in this way. And therefore, if we can do a little bit to help as a country, that is the positive side of the argument. I, I, I was going to ask you <coughs> there. Now, the question I was framing in my mind was, how do you retain your optimism, your faith in human nature? But I suspect that the answer to that question lies in 
Prague in 1939 and the fact that people helped you? I think part of it is that, although I argue that the, <coughs> the argument for, for child refugees now yes. does not depend upon the background of the individual putting the argument. However, I'd be foolish to deny that I'm not emotionally more involved with it. No, I didn't mean that. I'm more interested in where you retain your, your optimism <coughs> yeah. because oh, for, for people of my generation, things are pretty horrible at the moment in the context. I've never yeah. seen posters like that Breaking Point oh. poster before, yeah. except in Joseph Goebbels' documentaries. Yeah, that's right. that's I've right. never seen this stuff in my lifetime. So I get very depressed at the thought that it's come. But yeah. you've seen it before and you've seen good prevail and you've been rescued. Yeah. The answer is yes. Uh, so I must deep in, deep in, my, deep yes. in my soul. Uh, th- there, is, there is some optimism based upon the fact I've been through this. Yes. We got our, it, it got better <coughs> and we, it's going to get better again. So there is, there is, there is some of that optimism. Uh, yeah, of there course. Must be. But the other thing, <coughs> the other thing that, that keeps me going is this, that working with, in, in the refugee, with refugees, particularly child refugees in, in northern France or Greece or wherever, there are some wonderful young people. There are some great NGOs, you know, Safe Passage, Help mm. Refugees, some great N- NGOs. And they, they have some wonderful people, some paid a little, some volunteers. And it is so inspiring to work with people who are so committed. And it's very humbling for me, inspiring and humbling, that these people are giving everything for people who are so vulnerable. And I think that's terrific. And I, and if I backed off, I'd be letting not just the refugees down, but also these people. And as a country, you know, the, the media describe us as a country with a lot of people, a lot of greedy bankers and all this sort of stuff. Mm. I think we've got some wonderful young people in this country. I don't want to sound patronizing. No, I, no, I'm don't. humbled by, by having worked with them, met them. I think they're wonderful people. And that is so inspiring. And that gives me a sense of optimism as well. And it's oddly, it hasn't occurred mm. to me before, but it's happening in a context that's quite unreligious. Often the missionary work or the idea yeah. of... Yeah. Duty would would have a religious context to it, but ours seems to be quite a secular charity. Well, there's both. I of think. Of course. I think at the moment, uh, because I, I I do go and speak at meetings, I get invited, so I, where I, where I have the time to accept, I accept. And and I'm I'm a humanist. Okay. Yes. I never was religious, although my father was Jewish. Yes. I, never religious. Um, it wouldn't have saved you from. Well, no, I, I was, uh, as somebody said to me, you're not Jewish at all, because it goes down the mother's side. I said, well, the Nazi thought I was Jewish <laughs> enough. Uh, <laughs> and this guy had the grace to say there's no answer to that one. <laughs> Good. <laughs> so, so, but I've been to, I've been to lots of um, uh, synagogues, and I've spoken, you see, and um, um, the faith communities have been very good. Yes. And there's a, there's a plaque uh, off the central lobby in the House of Commons, which about just over 20 years was put up. And it says something like this, uh, thank you to the people of Britain on behalf of the 10,000 children who mm. came on a kinder transport from Germany, Austria, and Czechoslovakia. Thank you for giving us a welcome and safety. Okay. And I was there at the original ceremony. And a few months ago, we decided to rededicate the plaque. And we had the chief rabbi and the Archbishop of Canterbury and the Speaker of the Commons. Because we just wanted to do that. So, so although a lot of it is secular, the faith groups have been also pretty good. Of course. Uh, and, and I don't want to take away from no, the, support, I, I, the support they have given. They tolerate me as uh, me for being a humanist. Uh, <laughs> but, but, Cuckoo in the nest. But, but, uh, but uh, uh, you know, the, 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 I've talked in synagogues, I've talked in yes. churches and so on. Uh, and I, I think it's important to know that we've got the campaign on behalf of child refugees isn't religious or non-religious. No. It's both. It's not, uh, it's not, um, uh, it's not a form political party. We've deliberately stopped it being the property of one party by having it spread across because otherwise we wouldn't win. No, of course. And and, and you kind of, it's not just the, the, the politicians, is it? It's the it's the loyal party loyalists as well. If it gets perceived as a Labour issue or yeah, a Liberal right. issue we, or a Conservative we, issue, you turn off an awful lot of people who could help you. I, well, let's talk about that then because it, it, the, the passage of time and the swinging of this pendulum of public opinion is, is, is as interesting as it is dispiriting sometimes. If... You had sought to bring 3,000 child refugees to this Mm. country before, uh, off the top of my head, I'll pick the referendum and I'll also pick the financial crisis of 2008. Mm -hmm. My feeling is it would have been a lot easier. Yes, 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 I think it would. I think 
Well, I, I, I'm not sure about the financial crisis. Certainly, the refer- I think the referendum... The the, just the notion that well, how can we afford these children yeah. when we're struggling to fix... Well, that's one of the arguments that because people use. Why, you know, we, we can't even look after our own children, so why should we look after... To me, I say, <coughs> well, frankly, the austerity that's going on at the moment yes. is, is, is not of my making. No. Uh, it is the government's making, and we're a rich enough country to be able to look after vulnerable refugees and look after our own people better than we're doing now. We, we, we are. Why is that message so quiet, do you think? Is it just the the, the nature of our newspapers that have got a business model that encourages scepticism and anger and and, and hatred and rejection? And then that gets into the national bloodstream? Well, it may be that. I don't know. I I think think there is an anti-establishment mood, but it hasn't reflected in a political analysis of of, of what you're saying. So I think the anti-establishment mood, which we see in America with Trump, we've seen it in many European countries, where they they gravitate gravitate away from the established parties uh, to other parties. We had a bit of it with with UKIP, of course. And curiously enough, although the Scottish National Party is the establishment in Scotland, they managed to act as if they weren't the establishment, and so they they, they pick up the anti-establishment vote as well. So I I think it's partly, partly people are fed up with the order, the, with the existing order, and and they want to flail out in different directions, and they don't need to go any further than that. That's just right. just the, uh, things don't have to be like this. Yeah, and that's, then I think that's quite a, that's quite a strong mood. And yes, it, clearly, it, it, but it doesn't lead to unless we can channel it into a more positive direction. It, it, it stays in well, that. Well, the problem is with the demagogues that when you start asking them for detail, that's when they just start shouting louder, that's isn't right. it? But, so, 2016, you, you bring an amendment to the Immigration Act to offer unaccompanied refugee children safe passage to Britain as this crisis continued. And, and, you know, even in my notes here, I've written migrant crisis, which is part of the problem, isn't it, that you've pinpointed. We should have been calling it a refugee. You can't have a migrant crisis yeah. Yeah. because migration is voluntary. Yeah. You can only have a crisis with refugees. Yeah. Well, I think that's, that's right. What happened was that Save the Children discovered that there were 95,000 unaccompanied child refugees somewhere in Europe. Originally 25,000, and they up the figure. Anyway, on the basis of the 25,000 figure, I put down an amendment which said we should take 3,000, which would be our share. Mm. I've always argued we should take our share. We, we can't take the lot, but uh, and other European countries should act equally yes. responsibly, and many don't. Uh, so we take our share. And so I put the amendment down, and um, then uh, the, the government got a bit excited at the moment under the immigration and the law they got a bit excited and wanted me to withdraw the amendment and I said no 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 how does that have, <coughs> how do you get a message like that Alf how do you get the do you get a phone call in the in the middle of the night or do you get a what telling me to withdraw yeah. the amendment oh well I know ministers would bump into me in the lobby right but then the, I really got the message when Theresa May who was home secretary asked me to go and see her in the office in the commons now I'd met her before and where I'd met her was at one of Nicky Winton's birthday parties, because he lived in Maidenhead, yes. and she in was his MP, yeah. and she'd come to one of his birthday parties, you know, with all the cameras on yeah. her, because not, you know, it's quite a big thing for a constituency MP to go to a hundred and second or hundred and third birthday party, <laughs> of, course, of yeah. course. Anyway, so she asked me to go and see her in the House of Commons, and she said she'd like me to withdraw the amendment. So I said, why? <laughs> and she said, because if these kids come, more will follow. So I said, first of all, that's not. Uh, no clear hard, hard and fast evidence of that but more importantly we would be leaving children vulnerable sleeping in fields in the jungle in Calais in the streets anywhere vulnerable to trafficking prostitution criminality can't let that happen that would be right so here's the thing which I didn't tell too many people at the time uh, we, Britain did have a small scheme to take 20,000 Syrians from Jordan and Lebanon over a five-year period, which is very few, (coughs) take 20,000 children under what we call the Vulnerable Person Scheme. And Theresa May said to me, if you drop your amendment, I will add 3,000 to that 20,000 figure. And that that will, and there'll be many children. Mm. And I said, that's great. We'll have that. We can do both. And she said, no. It's either or. And here's the thing. It wasn't either or, because that, she thought I'd accept her thing. Uh, I'd give way. I didn't give way. I said, I can't, I'm too committed, I can't possibly give way. 
but the 3,000 figure stayed in the system. Oh, really? The Home Office never, the cock up by the Home Office. <laughs> so I, wasn't, I didn't talk about it too much at the time because Correct. I'm afraid People it would it. So the, actually, one of the little victories I've had is this extra 3,000 from the region because there are still 3,000 of them children coming yes. to safety. And, uh, and it's always been a bit, uh, now I can talk about it. But at the <laughs> it's time, a I, th- complete. I thought, if the, yeah, if the Home Office, well, they're all here yet, but at least they were well in the system. Yes. So the, there's this oddity that the vulnerable person scheme, what people tell you, it's 20,000 plus 3,000. 23,000. So I couldn't take the any dubs, credit for that. Anyway. Dubs 3,000. You must. So I said no. So I, I said I said no to her. Yes. Okay. I won't drop my amendment. I said I can't. Uh, not knowing she wouldn't. Just the 3,000. Still do the other thing. Right. Yeah, anyway, we, the, we take our victories where we get them. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I went to the uh, Commons and my friends, it passed the Lords very yes. easily, went to the Commons and my friends said, um, look, sit in the gallery. Uh, I used to be in the Commons, so I know this. Of course. Thing. They sit in the gallery and the one facing the Conservative benches because we wanted some of them to to see them you. Yeah. And so I was sort of sit up there and give them the eye. Really? And I was sitting up there giving them the eye. I don't know how you give people the eye. One <laughs> of, the speaker nodded to me and one or two people, uh, he's good on human rights, and yes, one or two is. people looked at me slightly sheepishly, so I said, they're not going to vote. Anyway, the, 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 the vote came and we just lost. One thing happened, though, and it's what I call parliamentary gobbledygook. I don't know whether your, your listeners are up for parliamentary gobbledygook. Let's try them. Okay. So <laughs> the Lords can't pass amendments which involved directly involve expenditure. Right. Uh, it becomes a matter of financial privilege. The Speaker has to announce that. And normally the government just waive that because every amendment that comes from the Lords involves expenditure. But in this case, out of sheer badness, as they would say in Ireland, out of sheer badness, the government did not waive the amendment. Okay. So... We lost it slightly. It mm. went. I, I bumped into Theresa May in the corridor. I said, "Look, you won. You won today. You, know, you ain't going to win next time." Anyway, so it went back to the Lords, uh, a bigger amend, a bigger majority, and then something very interesting happened. Public opinion began to wake up to this. It began to kick in. Me- I got messages uh, saying, "Keep on with the amendment. We support you." Local groups were being set up to welcome refugees, especially refugee children. It was phenomenal. I got a few. Of uh, course. I got yes. a few, and I didn't say all British public opinion supported it. No, of course. Uh, but it was a majority. It was absolutely phenomenal. It was wonderful. It was heartwarming. You could feel it with the yeah, wind in your you sails. Could feel it. People shouted at me in the street. Normally, when they shout in the street, they shout abuse at politicians. <laughs> no, they said keep going with the amendment. So, so, and so Theresa May summoned me in again. And this time she said, we propose to accept your amendment, knowing they were going to lose the vote. <laughs> yes. And, and and also, it was all about the optics for her. Yeah, it was right. all about the politics. That's right. That's I, right. I, I don't want to encourage you to, to, to be rude, um, and I'm sure you wouldn't be. But you must have been tempted to remind Theresa May either of her Christianity, to refer to the religious we discussed, yeah. her, her vicar yeah. father, or the circumstances in which you'd first made her acquaintance, that you were in Sir Nicholas Winton's... Well, well you see, on the, on, the, on the religious point, I didn't want to do that because no, I'm a humanist. Of course, I didn't want to do that. Uh, on the second point, I think she was, I think she was um, quite well aware of it because I, uh, when Nicky Winton had a memorial uh, uh, thing at the Guildhall in London, and I was talking to his daughter who was organising it, wonderful Barbara, Barbara Winton, and she asked me about having government speaker, and I said, have Theresa May. And she said, really? But with her policy? I said, yeah, just... The... And she made a great speech on the base of which I'd have given Theresa May a Labour Party membership card on really? the spot. Anyway, She's good at that. And so when she became Prime Minister, I wrote to her and reminded her of the speech she'd made at Nicky Winton's memorial. You see? So, yes. so I think she knew... She knew yes. all this, so and she, she knew of my background, and, and I didn't want to let her forget it. And one of the reasons for having a speak at that th- speak was that she had to make a more sympathetic speech, and I thought that would lock her in a bit more than it didn't work very well, but it was an attempt. And th- again, that pendulum of public opinion, which you've described beautifully swinging towards you, then began to swing away, partly, I suspect, because of the photographs of, of young men who appeared to be older, Well, which feeds into an appetite People want to be sceptical or, yeah. or, or callous. You, you can't create callousness. Yeah, that was, uh, for, none of those were children that, covered, that, that, that were subject to my amendment anyway. It doesn't matter, though, thing. does it? In, in the, no. in the, once and also, the... as, I, as I said in defence, uh, when you've travelled half around the world, you've gone through terrible experiences, maybe that ages you as well. Yes. But it was, in public relations terms, it was not at all helpful. No. Particularly as my mission, mission of those of us on the camp, has been to keep public opinion on side as much as possible. 
And 12 months ago, perhaps as a result of that change in mood, um, they sort of quietly abandoned the scheme after picking up just 350 of the 3,000 children they should well, have. Well, well, first of all, the three th- what happened was that after she accepted the amendment, the, the immigration minister at the time phoned me up and said the government proposed to accept the letter and the spirit of the amendment. Right. It's my contention they've done no such thing. No. However, the government decided to cap my scheme because they said local authorities cannot find any more foster places. And eventually it became 480. They made a mistake, 480. And we challenged this. It's been challenged in the courts where it's still going on appeal. Uh, We challenged it politically because we said we know of enough local authorities who are willing to provide more foster places. Not all, but enough to, to say the policy shouldn't be capped at that arbitrary figure. But it remains to be seen whether any progress will be made. Well, we are looking at ways in which we can, um, in future legislation, we can put an amendment down. But I can say there is a slightly, a slightly, uh, slightly more encouraging bit to it. There is also a European treaty, the Dublin Treaty, under the provisions of which, which we call Dublin Three, children who got, who in an EU country who got family in another one. Yes. can join them. So a Syrian boy in Paris could join an uncle in Stockholm. Okay. And these children were also uh, in the, in, in the jungle in Calais and in, in, in the camps, and the NGOs were working with both lots. Very few of those Dublin three children had come to Britain. Right. The result of my amendment is the campaign took on both lots. And we've had about 800 of the Dublin three children over so far, okay. and about 250 of the the ones yes. under, my, under my amendment. So the family reunifications plus the 250. And, and we're trying to, yes, it's about 1,000. And we're trying to keep the provisions of the Dublin Treaty in existence after we leave the EU. And I've got an amendment down which will be debated in the Lords, I think, the week after next, exactly to achieve that. Watch this space. Um, you've been to the, the, the so-called jungle in Calais. You've been to Lesbos as well, I think. No, I haven't. I've been haven't. to... Uh, I'm going to Lesbos in in uh, in May, I think. Uh, I've been to uh, camps in, in in Greece, in Thessaloniki, and near Athens. Yes. And I've been to Calais three times. Briefly, what do you find when you go there? Uh, 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 I think in Calais, the first two times, the jungle was still there, and then the third time, it's been all cleared. Well, what I found was appalling conditions that children and adults should live live like that. But in, in, in northern France, there was also what I call the triumph of the human spirit. There was still a sense of hope, mm. even if they had to cross the channel illegally on the back of a truck. Uh, uh, there was still a sense of hope, which I didn't see in the camps in Greece so much, where they seemed to be unable to escape from so, so easily. Uh, but certainly... Uh, I also found the French authorities had cleared half the camp, and in the middle of the jungle there was a shopping street. I mean, tremendously yes. resilient. They got the shopping street there, and there was little cafes and things. And um, uh, and like they shanty all, towns, aren't they? Yeah, in yeah. A way, yes. uh, and 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 in in on display they had tear gas canisters and rubber bullets. And I said, "What are they for?" And they said, "When the French authorities, the previous French government, tried to clear half the camp." Uh, they used them. I said, but these people are refugees. How can you do that? Well, he said, the National Front are very strong in this part of France. So the French government felt they had to act like the National Front. And I said, but you don't defeat the National Front by acting like them. So I was quite shocked by that, yes. to use tear gas and rubber bullets on refugees. Anyway, I found there was a very positive spirit, despite the awfulness of it. There was a, I came back with conflicting emotions. Of course. The third time I went, the jungle had been totally cleared. We'd made desperate efforts to persuade the government to bring Bring, children over. And there was still a a clothes bank and a food kitchen there, but there was no accommodation. And and it was all, and I I shuddered. I went just before the cold weather set in. Really? Uh, And I think I shuddered to think what it's like sleeping under the trees in this bitterly cold weather. And and, Uh, and you think more of the children than of the adults, inevitably. Well, well, look, I think of them because because I think under under either the Dublin Three Treaty or, or my amendment, you know, we should be taking them. The adults. Well, is, why don't you get? We're, near, we're nearly out of time, so I'll, I'll ask you a slightly impertinent question, if I may. Why, why don't you get angrier? I don't. I know, I don't I'm, I'm trying to be good-natured for your program. Well, uh, clearly you, know, you are by nature a very, yeah. very look, good look, man. Look, look. I tell you what it is. I vary between feeling tearful yes. and feeling very angry. Okay. And I am angry. Uh, but you don't get much done by being angry. I don't think so. I think I think we've got to be clever. We've got to go for public opinion. We've got to outsmart the government, 
and we've got a look, President Macron, one big good news, President Macron met Theresa May. And the outcome was they were going to speed up the process of getting That's kids right. over. Yes. And I said, it takes something for the French president to, speed to persuade up, right? to persuade our prime minister to do things which the British Parliament is not able to persuade her to do. Mm. So thank you, President Macron, well for what for, for what it's worth. Uh, and so I cheered up a bit then. Right. And I shall cheer up if we get some of these amendments through. So one has to keep optimistic. Let's end where we began with that television programme which introduced me to the notion of kinder transport. I'd just briefly love to know what it was like for people who haven't seen it. It's all over YouTube and, and, and what have you. Sir Nicholas Winton hadn't told his own family about the work that he'd done during the war. It, it emerged, I think, when a family member was going through boxes in attics. Uh, that's right. He'd been a very modest man. Actually, he stood as a Labour candidate for Maidenhead District Council in 1954-55, uh, as shown in his daughter's book yeah. and he'd written they'd written there that he'd helped refugees right. to come to Britain but nobody picked it up and it, so it was only picked up when they found the papers in his attic he was a very modest man it's an astonishing level uh, of modesty that's a self-effacing almost to the point of incredulity absolutely but nevertheless what a man and so there have been several television programs there was this is your life all but, these the, but the this is your life one was the best because you're in the room he's there and presumably his wife's had to sort of tell him some various concoctions to get him to go to watch this television program he doesn't know and then we're all there we stand up and cheer. <laughs> there, there were, how many of you were there that day? I don't, I don't know. I don't Over know. 100 of you, yeah, I yeah. think, and you were all children that he had personally yeah, that's right, saved that's right, that's right. in an operation that he hadn't told his own family about until latterly in life. And then yeah, Esther right. Ranson, the presenter, invited all of you yeah. former children yeah. to that's stand up, and he, it is one of the most powerful things I've yeah, ever seen well, on a I, screen. I, I, think, I think that's right. Uh, and I think he was totally bowled over. But, you know, he's also been bowled over on other cases. I, I know, you know yes, other, of course. Uh, and it's just that we've had reunions, we've had surprise events when he's come along. And, you know, it's just that we feel... There's a bonding between those of us that came on uh, through through his through his train, through his kind of transport. We're bonded, and we sort of have a fellow feeling. We're getting older. As I was on the youngest, it's 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 going it's going. You know, there won't be many of us left soon, but we have this bonding feeling, and we feel very affectionately towards him, as we would saved our lives, and and I think he's he's got a sense of quiet pride that we and our children and our grandchildren all owe their existence to him. Indeed they do. Alf Dubs, thank you so much. Thank you. 